digital cinematography, dramatic film techniques. That's today's webinar. And uh, you can definitely uh, access uh, prior uh, videos and instructional videos on the equipment we'll be using. Uh, so my name is uh, Tom Stranad. I'm the, uh, the lead digital artist of the Creator Space. So welcome everyone to today's webinar. A lot of exciting stuff coming up. We're gonna be doing a bunch of uh, basically live demos, hands-on work uh, virtually. And uh, so this is a webinar. We'll, this will also be uh, happening as a physical workshop for the uh, members of the Blue Mountains uh, Public Library, Collingwood Public Library and Wasaga Beach Public Library. And that, those will be happening in January. So it'll be a follow-up where you can uh, do what we have demonstrated today and it, you can do it hands-on to really get into it. So um, yeah, definitely wanna thank everyone for joining us. And uh, um, you know, the, the today's program, uh, we're really happy to be able to bring it to everyone. And we'd like to thank all of our partners in this. So we have the Canada Council for the Arts. And then we also have our library partners. So the Blue Mountains Public Library, Collingwood Public Library, and the Wasaga Beach Public Library. So all uh, partners that uh, will be, uh, you know, have digital arts equipment. So computers will be available uh, soon at all the libraries. Right now it's available at the Blue Mountains Public Library. I made a note there. You can access those if you're a Blue Mountains Public Library member. You can book some time on the iMac computers that have uh, some of the Adobe Photoshop software, Affinity software, DaVinci Resolve, all the different softwares that we're uh, talking about. And then uh, we also uh, have digital arts equipment. So the equipment that I'm demonstrating using today can be taken out currently from the Blue Mountains Public Library and uh, soon at the Wasaga Beach Public Library and then in the spring of 2021 at the Collingwood Public Library. So really exciting uh, news to be able to do that. So definitely uh, stay tuned and, and uh, let's uh, continue on. So uh, today's overview, we will look at the digital arts equipment that's in the demo. So I'm just gonna have a listing of it. And here's the great thing. So th this uh, platform, Crowdcast, once you're registered in, you can rewatch this. So don't uh, feel you know, that you need to take notes or if you miss something, you can get back to it and rewatch it after we're done. It's uh, pretty much right when we finish, you'll be able to rewatch it. So you can re review things, try some things out. And um, you know, even the lights we're demoing today, they can be taken out from the library. And at the same time, they're uh, very low cost. So we're trying to use equipment that if you really want to purchase some of your own, uh, you can get them as well. So we'll more about that uh, shortly. So we'll look at lighting for video, color temperature, three point lighting, high key versus low key, available light versus artificial light, depth of field and story. So these are all the things. So when I, when I say the term dramatic film techniques, we're talking about lighting for storytelling and usually for narrative versus uh, factual or documentary. But there, there's always crossovers. A lot of documentaries may choose to use dramatic techniques. So it's, it's more of that idea of dramatic techniques. I wanted to say that versus narrative film techniques. So it's really, you're trying to do a dramatic lighting, whatever it may be. And we'll look at how, you know, bright lighting is just as dramatic as dark shadowy lighting, right? So that's, that's what we're going to look at today. So the equipment we're using today is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. Um, so here's just kind of a preview. Everything's set up here. We have the, the camera right over here. So the Blackmagic camera and then the lights. So the equipment that's uh, in play today, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera can shoot uh, 4K resolutions. Then we have some prime lenses. So the idea with prime lenses is, is that they're fixed focal length. That means that they're stay the same. They don't zoom. So zoom lenses we're used to like on our phones and some cameras where you can like zoom in and out. So you can basically make it a longer lens, a telephoto, you know, kind of 50 millimeters plus is telephoto and then you can go wider like 24 or under. So that's the idea with a zoom. But in this case, we're using prime lenses. So we're gonna be changing some of the lenses and just looking at what that does as well. Uh, then we're using the newer 480 LED light that's on a stand as well. Um, and then we're also using a newer softbox. And that's basically a cover that lets us uh, make the light softer. And uh, that, again, equipment that is all available from the libraries. And then we have a tripod with ball head. I just say tripod because, you know, whether in this case I'm using a Manfrotto, uh, there's also the uh, e-image tripod. So, you know, anything with a ball head. And the ball head, the idea is that you can uh, adjust it and level it without having to move the legs up or down. So it's a quick adjustment for video. And it also lets you do pan and tilt. So it has the ability to go uh, a pan left and right and a tilt um, up and down. So that's the, the fun part of that. 
So again, all of this equipment is available to, uh, for loan to members of the Blue Mountains Public Library. Soon it will be available at the Saga Beach Library and then eventually in the Collingwood Public Library as well. Uh, just to note, you must pass a digital video proficiency test and this will be like online tests and uh, then you can access it and we, we uh, add you into the library system so you can take it out just like a book. Uh, different uh, durations exist right now with the um, uh, situation of the uh, pandemic so there's uh, different lengths of rentals but they, they will be adjusting as we move forward as well. Okay, so lighting for video. In digital video, I uh, just wanted to have a quick overview here. What you see is what you get. So the digital monitor on the camera essentially lets you see what your image is. So there isn't as, that much guesswork. You're able to see exactly what you see is what you get. And I think that's that's the great advantage of digital cinema is that we're not using film that you know we can expose, we try to figure out what the right exposure is, what it will look like. We don't really know until it's developed and there's a delay. But in this case, we can see what we're getting and we can even play back what we're filming or recording. Uh, so that's that's the real advantage of digital cinema is what you see is what you get. So you can really, really uh, you know perfect and shape your lighting and, and work on that dramatic effect. You can use any type of light. Um, one of the things here I like to note is you know some lights can flicker. So that could be fluorescent light bulbs tend to flicker if they're just normal fluorescent light bulb. But generally, a lot of the LED lights uh, don't flicker, they're quite good, even household type bulbs are very reasonable. Um, and then some night lights here, I've just made a note, aren't really designed for video, so those can flicker. So uh, you'll notice it, you'll see like flickering, and again, what you see is what you get. So if the light is flickering, there's an issue with that light, so try to use something else. The newer 480 LED lights are what's called continuous lighting kits. They stay on, they don't flicker, and then they can uh, work in different color temperatures as well. What is color temperature? So color temperature is measured in Kelvin units. And we have uh, went over this a bit in a few other of the webinars too, but I just wanted to, to uh, you know, rehash what, uh, what these elements are. And we'll look at this a bit more today as well. So tungsten light bulbs and candles are with uh, 3200 degrees Kelvin. So they're warmer on the spectrum in the chart than daylight and our actual sunlight. Even though we might think it's warm, it's a cooler light. It's 5600 degrees Kelvin. So our camera, can be set up to work in different color temperatures. So for example, what I'm gonna start with demoing is the camera is at 5,600 degrees Kelvin, and then it could be changed to, to a different color temperature. So based on that our lights also, these, these newer lights that I'm demoing with, have the ability to go tungsten or daylight. So they're what's called the uh, uh, a mixed color temperature um, light and they can either go 3200, 5600 or they can be a blend. You can actually blend the two together to add a little bit of warmth to the daylight and, uh, and work that way. So that's uh, a little bit on the color temperature side. So if you have a window that's open, that will be 5600 degrees Kelvin from the sunlight coming in through a window. If you have a lamp, usually in a house, uh, incandescent light bulb would be 3200 degrees. So it's more on the tungsten side, that warmer side. So just things to be aware of. And you'll see it again in your image when you're uh, you know, looking up on the monitor with the, the Black Magic camera and what it looks like and what it's doing so you can adjust accordingly. Okay, so three-point lighting, what is this? So we're gonna start with three-point lighting and use it to demonstrate a variety of dramatic techniques. So three lights to light a subject. This is really the uh, cornerstone of lighting for video and digital cinema. You basically have a key light, which is your main light. Then you have a fill light that helps to fill in the shadows caused by the key light. And then you have a backlight, which is called a separation light. It can also be called a ribbon light. And that lets you separate the subject from the background. So sometimes the subject could look like they're just part of the background, but by putting a little bit of light, a backlight or a ribbon light around the subject, it separates them from the background so that we can understand that they are not part of the background and that there's depth to the background. So what we're always striving in our lighting is to create a three-dimensional representation of the space that may not work if it's very flat looking and everything's blending together. So that's why I call it a separation light. And then we'll, as we'll see today, the key light is your main light and the fill light we, can, we don't even have to use. So although it's, there's three-point lighting, we can also light with one light as we'll be doing today as well. For different dramatic effects. So, but the three-point lighting is kind of our basic main cornerstone and you know the the, the main type of lighting that you'll always hear about three-point lighting. So we want to start with that. 
through point lighting in a diagram, you see the camera is right on, then at 45 degrees from the camera on an angle, we have our key light at the subject, usually at 100%, like full light. And this is, there's always exceptions. Then you have another fill light on another 45 degrees, and then you have the backlight that's uh, basically about 180 degrees from um, the, uh, the camera on the backlight, and it's doing a separation. So that's kind of the idea with this chart. Um, and again, there's exceptions. You can play with it, move it around. But that's the idea is that there's that kind of backlight that's behind the person, the subject. There's a key light that's 45 degrees to the camera, usually kind of pointing down in this diagram they're showing. And then a fill light that's kind of more on and just fills about half of the intensity of the other light. So that's our three-point lighting. Essentially, it looks like, ends up looking like this. Can't really see what it is, but you know, here we have a light we have our backlight, you can see in the background, we have a light on the left, we have a light on the right with a softbox, so that's what the little black uh, front is, the softbox. So those are our three lights and we end up with this. And you know, right now it doesn't have a lot of uh, shadow and, and so on, but you can see it's, we have a separation from the black background um, on the, um, the uh, antlers and you know, this is how we've achieved it in uh, the three point lighting. So that's how it is at, at, uh, at work. Uh, then today, we're, I just want to introduce this subject and we'll, we'll get back to it in, in the live demo. So high key versus low key. Really important for uh, dramatic uh, types of uh, filming techniques and lighting. High key lighting, we're basically use, utilizing a bright key light and potentially fill. And it's limiting the shadows, so it's less moody, very bright overall image. And essentially, this is kind of how we're starting here when we look at this. Fairly bright and you know, an overall bright image, not a lot of shadows, right? So this, this to me, I, would, I started off with a high key. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna rework this and make it into low key. And then what low key does is it utilizes very little key for increased shadows, and then it becomes very moody and places the subjects in shadow. So the film backlight may become the main source. So you might not even have a, a key light, a main light. You might just end up with just a little bit of fill light and it gets moodier and that could be dark shadows. Uh, and that's, you know, usually kind of moodier, scarier moments versus high key is more associated with storytelling. Like, you know, when it's like comedies, drama, that is just kind of a regular scene. I like to say that doesn't have a lot to, of moodiness to it. Let's say in an office scene, it would be kind of high key, um, you know, maybe a restaurant during the day. And then in the night, if you did a restaurant, you might opt out, uh, opt in to do like a low key where you have more shadows and have a moodier looking evening setting, right? So those are the kind of options of how it can help with storytelling. Also low key, we just finished with, um, you know, Halloween season in, uh, in October. So that kind of spooky horror films are known for low key, really dark shadows, people, um, you know, if you're doing night exteriors, tends to be usually low key. It's hard to do a lot of high key, so there's more shadows. Uh, but daytime tends to be more high key, right? In general, outside. Uh, so, you know, again, we want to try to think about relating this to the stories as we, as we look at uh, these types today. Then available light versus artificial light. So we have our LED lights and, uh, or film lights, and these are essentially artificial. These are placed, right? So all these lights are placed. They're not natural to this room, to our studio setting here, right? So, but I do have uh, an actual available light which is, can also be called a source light. You can see that table lamp that's just above the goat. Now, it's just there. Um, and when we, you know, when we go to the shot here, you don't even see it. But we're gonna look at how if we you know, treat a source light or our, uh, available light uh, in, a, in a shot, we can use it to then redo our lighting to represent that. And that's what I made a note here. So it's usually what's available. So you might just be using a camera and just using like daylight from a window you could use uh, lamp lights just from desks or from the ceiling, right? So those kind of available lights. And then good artificial lighting, I like to state here, is, um, uh, you know, recreates available light and it's motivated so that a key light or any light resembles a window or a table lamp, for example. So, you know, that's the idea. We start to motivate when we really get into the, you know, great dramatic lighting for digital cinema. We try to recreate the artificial lighting to represent the available light or pretend what is the available light. And again, this is the example here. Here we don't see the lamp. There is a lamp, 
So we, we can always imagine, okay, there's a lamp somewhere, and then we light it as if there's a lamp. And that's what we're going to do today and as we get to the end of the, uh, the demos. Um, and then our final element here that we want to explore is depth of field and story. So our prime lenses in cinema camera, we can use wide apertures because it's called, they're manual lenses, so it's not automatic. So it's not auto exposure, auto focus. We choose what's in focus. We choose how much, how it's exposed. So the aperture. The aperture is always really cool because it essentially, uh, you know, opens or, or uh, closes. And, um, you know, and the, the beauty of that is that, that you can uh, you can then see um, you know what's happening. So I'm going to just try and hold this up here. So you can see here. So this is the lens. This is wide open, right? And then you can see see how it's closing, right? And now I'm going to open it wide up and see it's totally open the circle, and now it's closing down. So if it's open, we have a shallower depth of field, just kind of like the shot is right now. The background of uh, behind me is out of focus. If I close it down more, like so. Right, I get a, a, a larger depth of field, greater depth of field, so more can be in focus. Potentially the background and my face would be in focus at the same time. So th those are those depth of field options. So by manipulating the aperture, if we are opened up, we'll have a shallower depth of field, right? So there's a combination of that. And we, we talk about this in a webinar about uh, manual digital cinematography that we'll be uh, posting, so you can uh, review that as well, but uh, a little bit more in depth than that. But um, by then deciding what's in focus, we can help guide our story as well. So it's not just the lighting that we decide what's in light or what's in shadows, but we can also decide what's in focus. And then we can do focus pulling or racking focus from one subject or another or an area to change and decide where the audience should be looking or viewing. And we can decide to have everything in focus with a, uh, a larger depth of field. So we should always consider how and why we use depth of field because that is really essential in our storytelling in uh, you know, how we're gonna um, you know, deal with, with uh, uh, you know, the story that we wanna tell and the, the drama that we want to unfold. Okay, so let's go back and uh, you know, let's, let's start off here with um, the, uh, you know, just the, the overall um, you know, lighting for video and like I mentioned, so you know, what we see is what we get. So this is the direct output from the camera. So I know exactly what I'm seeing and what I'm, what I'm getting, right? So that's really important. So here's our setup of the lights. Um, and we're going to just play around a little bit with the key light, fill light, backlight, and just show what each of these looks like. And then the kind of dramatic mood we can get um, as a result from each one. Okay, so let's start that up. So I'm just going to get into the, uh, the shot here. And so right now, what we have is this is our... Uh, our, uh, our key light. So I'm just going to put it up and this is essentially what, what we talked about is a, that kind of high key element. See how everything is basically, uh, there isn't really shadow, everything's bright. Our whole subject's very bright. Okay, so this key light, now watch if I go low key. See how now we start to get that shadow on the side? So I've basically turned it off. And now I have, you know, just light on this side, right? But I don't really have a lot of light here. So that's pretty interesting, right? So we start to get into this, this the lighting uh, concept there. Now what I'm gonna do is uh, if I go over to the, to the other side, so we have this, this box right over here, right? And now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, turn this one a bit lower as well. Okay, so you can see how we've really reduced uh, our light here. Let's, let's look what we've come up with. So look at that. Now we have a very dark side, right? In terms of there isn't a lot of light here. There's a bit of light here. So we have that backlight that's still lighting there. Okay, so this is the backlight only. So now let's look at uh, the, you know, kind of each element. So what I'll do is I'll start with just the one, just the, the backlight only. So this is our backlight only. You can see there isn't a lot of light on the front, but you can see how it's really separating, um, you know, the, the backlight from the, the, the front light. There's no front light. So the, the, this goat ends up pretty dark, okay? And, you know, that's, that's a really neat uh, way that, you know, to, to deal with it. And uh, this had a little bit of extra light happening. So I just want to turn off. 
So that's just our backlight, right? So now watch what happens when we add a little bit of uh, the key light. So this is our key light on this side, right? So again, you can see that it starts to add the light right here, right? So what I've done is, is added the light. This is our key light here, right? That's our backlight. And right here is our fill light. And this has that a uh, bit of a soft box. And the idea there is that that way it's really um, not adding a lot of light as the diagram was showing about 50%. And what, the, what kind of soft box we're using is it's designed for the light itself. So it's, it just looks like this, okay? And then what, what we do is it just opens up. It's kind of like a reflector, if anyone's used the photography reflector. So this just opens up like so. Oops. Has little magnets. Okay, and then it feeds itself right onto the light. And there's this Velcro. Okay, so this Velcro just goes, this is the back of it. And you can see there's just the white front, right? And that's a soft box. So it just adds, uh, it diffuses the light and it reduces the amount of light. So look what happens if I just take this and put this in front of my key light, right? So we got that and then see how it reduces it, but it softens it. Okay, and now let's look at it through the camera. So this is directly through the Blackmagic camera. And I should note too that this is a, uh, um, we are using the uh, 20, uh, 25 uh, millimeter lens right now. Okay, so that's before, so that's open. And this is with the softbox on. So see how it just kind of, it reduces it a little bit, softens it, right? So that's a great tool. So the key light I'm just leaving open. Okay, so now we have the key light, we have the backlight. So this is kind of one dramatic effect, right? We have this shadow on the side, a little bit moody, right? And now look, look what happens if I, I'm gonna just add a little bit of the fill light, right? So now I've added a bit of fill light over here, right? And so what I've done is I've actually turned this light on to give it a little bit of fill, right? And now look what's happened to our goat. This shadow is gone. Right, so that's the fill, literally filling. Right, so now our dramatic storytelling is what do we want to do? Generally, this is still a little bit moody, there's a bit of shadow, right? So we're still, uh, you know, doing kind of a cinematic, dramatic lighting with playing with shadow. So I always like, a lot of cinematographers will say that you're, you're not really lighting, you're just, you're lighting with shadows. So it's your shadows that end up creating what your light is and what your mood is. So that's that's a really cool idea to think of. So, you know, the more shadows we have, we're using we're deciding what is in shadows and what isn't in shadows. And we can ultimately say we don't want any shadows, right? So, let's go back to that fill light and look, I'm going to add even more, right? So, I'm going to boost this up a bit more. Right? So I've boosted it up. You can see how it's very even now. Right? So I'm trying to almost match the other one. Look at that. Now we have like no shadow. Right? So this is what I would call high key lighting. We're really lighting the whole subject and making sure there isn't any shadow. So this is one type of dramatic lighting. So this is generally, you know, um, you know, a lot, some, some films might just want that where you don't want a lot of shadow. You want everything, uh, you know, evenly lit. Uh, so this is kind of what's happening, but we're still dealing with the three-point lighting. So we still have our backlight, we have our side lights and everything, right? So we have that kind of idea. Okay, so now let's look at, so that was the high key. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the, uh, the backlight here, right? So let me just find the knob here. And just turn this right off. Okay, so we can get that idea. So now we're just dealing with the front light. And now we're going to have this, this kind of shadowy background. So that's another way to deal and add some mood. Right, so you can see it's, it's kind of, it's not separating the back as much now. But it's very fr more frontal lighting, which is a neat look as well. So this is without the backlight. This is just like that. Now, let's go one step further. 
I'm going to turn off the, the key light. Look at that. Now we have a very moody uh, subject, right? So what I've done is turned off this, the backlight's off, the key light's off, and I just have the fill light. And this is what I would call low key lighting, where we have all this shadow, right? The whole subject is really drenched in shadow. And it's, it's a lot moodier, right? And you can see even, the, you know, the background is just soft and, and our depth of field is really focused just on the goat. And, and that's it. So this is that kind of low key, low key lighting idea, right? And we can go even further and it's really fun. We can play with, you know, very little light levels. So because our cameras are quite light sensitive, so we, we essentially have the, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. And these lenses, are, they're all fast lenses. So they can uh, shoot at, uh, you know, 1.5 uh, f-stop. And so that's very fast. So it can work with really low light. And that allows us to further play with, with our uh, dramatic effects. So look at that. Now I've really lowered the key light. And let's look at that. So that's a real good example of low key. Just a little bit of fill on the goat. There's no key, there's no backlight, right? So that's, that's that. So now let's play with, okay, we have a single source of light. Let's put the, the backlight back on. Okay, so I have that one back on. Okay, right away you can see how, how much more light's been added. And look at that, and that's pretty neat too. So that's without the key light. So that's just with the soft fill and the background light. I like this kind of a look where it's just two point versus three point. Sometimes I find the three point uh, you know, lighting can be a little bit too much. So I often like just lighting with two. And I think you know, that, can, that can be enough, right? So that's really cool. So now let's look at some color temperature ideas. So we talked about, so that's our three point lighting, how we can go high key, low key. So, you know, high key is really literally, you know, turning on the, the key light, right? And it's like getting rid of those shadows. So this is my key light, you know, off and then turning it on. So, you know, really low key, high key, literally you can take it that way uh, by definition. But you can see there's more to it. It's really, you know, building those shadows and figuring out how much, how much light we really want, right? So we can really reduce those shadows. And that's the backlight doing a lot of the work with just a little bit of fill. That to me is a pretty interesting look because I have that nice backlight and I have a little bit of fill light and I can see everything quite well. A little bit of the background is still visible, the black curtain. And, um, you know, again, it's out of focus and, and that looks pretty neat to me. So now let's look at different color temperatures. And we might look, okay, we'll look at color temperatures and then we'll see how we can actually use it to help, uh, you know, uh, rep replicate our artificial light. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, let's go back to our wide shot here. So now the back panel here, there's two knobs. One is cool, one is warm. Cool represents daylight. Then there's a warm one that represents uh, tungsten. So look at that, you can actually see it looks like fire as it comes on, right? So that's the key light going just warm only. Okay, so that's 3200 versus here's the cool light. See how it's, it's bluish or it actually looks neutral. So my camera setting is at 5600 degrees Kelvin. So the sensor is in daylight mode. So daylight looks, daylight blue light looks normal. And then the tungsten light looks warm. So watch if I add a little bit of tungsten. Let's cut into what our camera sees. Look at that. Now we have that warmth coming out on the side here of the goat. We have that really interesting warmth happening. Right? So again, nothing and adding that tungsten warmth. Right? So now we go, okay, well, why are we doing something like that? Sometimes people are like, oh, we just want to add a little bit of warmth. Right? So let's go back and figure out, okay, why would we want to do that? So let's go back to our wide and we talked about artificial light and available light or source light. So if we want to motivate our lighting dramatically and figure out why we're lighting in a certain manner, let's turn on this table lamp that we have here. So I'm going to turn this on. Okay. 
right? So look at, look at what that's doing. Here's a table lamp, right? So it's added a lot of warmth because it's tungsten balanced light bulb, right? So if I, if I turn, if I turn everything off, this is the fun part. I'm going to turn all the lights off. Okay. So you can see just that this is the using available light now. So I'm going to turn this one off too. Okay. Available light is just going to be this table lamp here and turn the backlight off, right? So this is our available light. Okay. I'm going to move it over here a little bit. Okay. And it's just as if, you know, imagine if you're sitting at a, at a desk, you know, doing some work and that's what your light is. So this would just be available light, right? So that is just the tungsten light bulb on the goat. And we go, okay, well, that's available light. That could be the source, right? And then how can we recreate that? So now in our minds, we got to look at, okay, that's what it looks like. Okay, so great. We go, okay, that's what it looks like. So now I'm going to turn that off. We're going to have total darkness, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to start to recreate what, what this would look like. So first I'm going to start with a little bit of the, the fill light here, right? Being warmth like we had on the, on the other light. Then I'm going to put a little bit of fill light, but what I like to do is, is have a blend so that it's a, it's a bit of a cooler light on that side or, or like normal, right? So here we are. Now we're starting to kind of recreate that table lamp look. So we're using our artificial light to create what looked like was there an available light or naturally through source light. So if you go, okay, there's a lamp, there's a you know subject there. How do we create that? So look, we're, we're trying to recreate this. Now I'm going to turn on the, the backlight here. Okay. okay and that's, that, that to me looks pretty close to what we were getting with the original light. So dramatically we've been able to create the desk lamp, right? As if it's, if, as if it's a, uh, uh, happening art through artificial lights, we've been able to recreate that desk lamp mood. And that's the really fun part of the different t color temperatures. So I'm putting warm light over here, right? So I put warm light here, tungsten light, the fill lights, a little bit of blue, just to get rid of the shadows and the backlight I've reduced to 50% of what it used to be. And I'm trying to emulate that desk lamp, right? So now I'm going to turn this desk lamp on, right? You can see there's a little bit of warmth still coming from behind. Okay. And there, there's our look. And now what I need to do is just adjust my exposure a bit. Cause see, we're, we're getting a little bit blown out in terms of the exposure. So if I kind of lower it down here, now we can actually technically keep our desk lamp in there, right? But we've lit this, this is representing the desk lamp. So this artificial light becomes like the source light. It's giving me that tungsten look. The, the soft light's filling in a bit of the shadow and we have this backlight. So we're artificially augmenting natural available light, but we can keep both on. And that this is the really fun part of doing dramatic lighting where we can keep the source light and we can also show it, uh, you know, leave it on, but we can show it through our artificial light. And to me, that's a really interesting point to be at where we can create that kind of a shadowy look. Okay. So now let's, uh, let's look at, then I just change the lens. So I'm going to basically just flip off the, uh, the lens that's on the, on the camera here. And I'm going to just put the 35 um, millimeter lens on. Okay, so I'm just going to swap, swap it over to another prime. Okay, and let's go right into it. All right, we actually went the other way. This is, we're actually going to the wider lens. Uh, I grabbed the wrong one. So that's perfect. That's good. 
Yeah, so that was our, our 25. And now we are going to our... So th this is our 35, or sorry, our 25. So as you can see, we're a bit wider. Just gonna focus that in. There we go. Okay. So look at look at that, right? So we've we've created that light. We can see the the desk lamp here in the wide shot. Right. So same idea, and you can see it. It's holding up really well with a with a different lens. Let's cut to the lens here. So again, if I'm open up all the way, it's a little bit overexposed. I'm just closing down the aperture to about 2.8. And then I can decide what's in focus, right? So you can see just the goats in focus. The focus is basically pretty shallow, just like the width of my hand and then the background goes out of focus. So that's how we can play with the different lenses to figure out what, um, you know, what we want to show where, right? So now let's do another flip. I'm going to go to the 55 millimeter. Okay, so that was the 25. And now I'm going to go to, so that was the 25, a bit wider. We started with the 35. And now we're going to go to a 55 or, you know, it can also just be a 50. In this case, it's a 55. Okay. And I'm going to go to about 2.8. And here we go. Let's see what that looks like. Okay. So now you can see we're getting a bit closer. All right. Look at that shallow depth of field where we're just looking at the goats. So I'm just going to pan up a little bit just to adjust my composition and framing. Right. So we, we talked about this before, but that whole kind of rule of thirds idea, you know, where we, we break down the shot and you can see the kind of the, you know, it's on the camera left in the rule of thirds. And you can review some of those concepts in our earlier videos. So composition can be really important. So rather than going right into the center, that's fine too. What we're doing is we're playing with rule of thirds. So we're either doing camera left in the intersecting points in the if you break down the image into um, nine squares and the intersecting points on the right. So usually we like to, you know, compose in this kind of a close up, close shot of the goat to either be on the left or right. So something else to think about. And then again, like we talked about what's in focus, you can see it's pretty shallow. So just the face, right? The background's totally out of focus, right? My hand is out of focus here. Right. And then the focus is just here. And then again, my hand goes out of focus behind the goat. So really shallow depth of field. We're using that table lamp. And this is how we've then gone from the wide 25 to 35 to 50. And we've, you know, we light for the overall scene. And then we can go into these close ups and we can augment it a little bit and say, OK, well, you know, maybe we want a little bit more, a little bit more or a little bit less key light. So we can augment that just slightly. But a real important rule in this dramatic lighting concepts is that, you know, we light for the whole scene with all our lights in the widest possible shot first. So in that case, you know, our 25, then we go to the 35 and we can go to a 50. So by lighting for the widest shot, it's easy to then move in. If we did it the other way, we started lighting for the 50, you know, we might A, have our lights a lot closer, potentially, and then we wouldn't be able to light for the wide, right? But in this case, we can go pretty wide, uh, even to the point that we can go, you know, even to like a fisheye type um, lens as well, right? So, so uh, just for fun, I'm going to put on a 7.5 millimeter uh, fisheye, just to, so we can see what that looks like um, in this kind of a lighting scenario. So let's put on a 7.5, so really tiny uh, lens. Okay, and then here we go. Here's the 7.5. Here's the fisheye. Yeah, so totally distorted uh, type of 
you can see what it's doing. But we see that we've lit for the widest type of area. And all we would need to do then is just move our lights. You know, this light could just be moved out of the shot a little bit, like so. Same with the backlight and then and this uh, side light here. And we're able to quickly, you know, go from a wide and then we can go to the 25 and so on, right? So a great way to start with the widest and move in. So that was our available light going with um, a table lamp, right? So if we can do the same principle and we can consider the idea that, you know, what happens if we are, um, you know, if we have a, a, a light that's on in the room. So let's go back to the 25 here. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the 25. So here's our 25. Okay, just adjusting the focus, and I'm just gonna do a little bit of composition to, again, just play with the rule of thirds a bit, so that we're kind of in the, you know, an interesting composition, not totally centered. So that's, now let's totally clear the, uh, Let's do one more setup here. So we're gonna clear the table lamp. We're gonna say, okay, there's no table lamp. Now we're gonna say there's a really bright window um, coming from the, the, uh, the back, right? And there literally is a window here in the studio that I have draped. So, you know, what would that look like? So what I'm gonna do then is put maximum light on in daylight. So I'm gonna say, okay, let's blast the daylight. Okay, so now we have that full backlight here. And what I'm gonna do is reduce the, the fill light. And we put a little bit of warmth as if we're inside and we have some table lamps and we have that back window. Okay, so you can see what I've done is I've reduced this key light, I've reduced the fill light my maximum light is that backlight that's acting like a window. Let's see what that looks like, right? So you can, you can almost feel like that window is behind the goat. And that looks pretty interesting. So we have like the shadow, we have a little bit of this warmth. You can see this warmth coming in on the side as if it's a, you know, there's like a table lamp. But again, it's, we're working with the shadows and we've, we've established that there's a window coming from back here. So we're no longer using the table lamp that is right above the goat, but we're saying there's a big window here. And that can be our available light using a window. So always think about the motivation and you know, how we're lighting it. Then we wanna think about, are we low key, high key? We wanna think about you know, how much depth of field we want. And then we, we wanna choose our lenses as well. So in this case, we have the 25 millimeter, right? And then we can go right back to Let's go back to um, the 50 I have right here behind me. Right? And these things just click on or off on the front. And let's go right back to the 50. And you'll see how interesting this looks in this closer shot. It's going to open up a little bit. Right? So really having that idea, it looks like you know, we're kind of in a, in a darker room. So I'm trying to represent and recreate what I'm really seeing here. And that's really fun too, is trying to recreate what your location is, but it's with artificial light. So now it doesn't matter if the sun moves in the actual window that's behind in that backlight, because dramatically we're controlling it with a little bit of key and uh, fill light. So we, look, we can boost that fill light a little bit really looks like there's just a window on, on the goat from this side, right? Really has that kind of feel to it. But there's still enough shadow here that we can create that dramatic look, right? And again, if we want to reduce the shadow, we can just boost this up, right? And we're getting into that more of that high key lighting, overall even lighting with multiple uh, light sources. So playing with the tungsten and daylight color temperature, depth of field lenses, and how much light is in the three-point lighting, and then whether we want to represent an artificial lamp, uh, sorry, an actual uh, source lamp, available light sor uh, source lamp, 
or available light window, we can decide what we want to use when and how, right? So that's a really cool, interesting way to, uh, to do everything, right? And you can see how, you know, what, what, this, what this can do dramatically. It could be really interesting um, for lighting concepts. Okay, so that takes us through um, all the stuff. So why don't we open up some Q&A time here. I'm sure there's a bunch of different questions. Um, so let's just uh, see if there's any questions, if anyone has any questions. It would be great to, uh, I can answer some. So I do want to reiterate that idea of shadows can be really crucial in, you know, what, what do we want in shadows? So let's go, let's go back to this kind of window idea. We could have zero fill, right? So that's zero fill. And you know, it's making that back window really, really important. Now let's take the, uh, this light off too. And now you can see, you know, we've probably put too much off, but that's the idea is like, okay, what does it look like if there's just a back window happening? And you can feel that window on the back of the goat. But we definitely need a little bit of fill here, or sorry, key light here. That just helps me put a little bit of light on the front. But see how interesting that is? We got that back window, a little bit of front light, very moody. And that could be a great way to you know, achieve that. And then I put a little bit of warmth just by adding that little warmth there. And that's whether you know, we want to establish that the room has a little bit of artificial lighting happening, perhaps a ceiling lamp, or it can just be totally like that. And to me, that's a great looking image just like that moody shallow depth of field motivated light from the window and a little bit of the the key light there okay so let me just look i have some questions coming in okay answer these okay um okay if the if the object had different uh strengths or different uh, colors so you know i guess you know different types of um contrast in the per in the subject as well the goat does have a little bit i tried to pick something that has a, you know like different colors within it uh, so you know you can see here too with the different colors the front the nose is brown i have the white curly like sheep hair and then the the antlers and stuff so you can see the light treat uh, uh, you know the white fur so imagine if someone um you know imagine if someone was wearing like a white sweater that would be the same idea. You get maximum reflection and light, and then the colors show up a lot more. So with, for example, when I put a little bit more of the, uh, notice how much more you see the warmth on the yellow, on the, I'm sorry, on the white, you see the yellow on the white than on the brown nose, right? It shows a lot more on, on that, on the white fur. So think about the colors of clothing that your subjects wear. Right, so we have our skin tones, that's one element. Then we also have uh, the clothing. So, you know, the goat in this case is, uh, you know, imagine if a person's wearing like a white sweater, that's kind of what's happening here in our, in our demo. It's reflecting a lot. So if that was a little bit different, it could end up being a, a bit different. So, you know, just for fun, we can swap out the goat with this, uh, penguin and let's just have a look at that so now we have kind of a less reflective subject right and now you can see that it you know it's still working but it needs a little bit more fill and now you can really see with the black uh, rim light how that's separating the background so that's where you can really start to see how important the separation is, that you can see the character separating from what is just a black curtain behind, right? So the different colors will reflect differently. So very good question. Okay, so a zoom lens, well, the same principles apply as with a prime lens. So definitely the zoom lens, um, the same idea applies, except that when we have a wider lens, there's there tends to be a greater... Uh, depth of field 
with the wider lens than in a telephoto lens, it's a shallower depth of field. So because I'm using this 50, which is on the you know kind of telephoto lens zoomed in on the zoom spectrum, it's much more shallower depth of field than when we had the 25 millimeter that had a little bit uh, a wider uh, uh, depth of field to it. So that will, depending on where you are on the zoom spectrum, right? So if you have like, let's say a 24 to 105 millimeter, like on a photo camera type lens, um, the 24 will have a, 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 a wider depth of field, right? Because it's a, it's a wider lens. And then at the 100 millimeter, there'll be a shallower depth of field. So, and that will affect how you light a little bit. Sometimes I find I need to add a little bit more light uh, when there's shallow depth of field to really make the separation pop a bit more than in the wider shot where it kind of picks up more because of that depth of field. So that's where it really changes things, the depth of field um, and you know what's, and, and be getting closer, right? So if you're getting in closer, you're seeing the details more than on the wider shot. So even here, just the wider shot, so wide, this is a 10 millimeter lens on, a, on another camera overseeing the whole scene. And you can see the depth of field is quite large. Everything's in focus, right? So that's going from there to, you know, a 50 or a hundred shallower depth of field, really different in the lighting, right? So we're using the same lighting, but look at the nuances that we're catching in this close up telephoto, right? So that would be the big difference in the zoom scenario, right? So the zoom lens and, and how that would work. So really good question. Okay. Um, how to light a black and white scene? Okay, really, really great question. Um, it's really not that different, except all of a sudden we're not worried about things uh, like, in this case, this character, he has the red nose. So, you know, that red nose is going to just be kind of darker in the monochromatic. And, uh, you know, and, and, and it's the same principles, except that you, can, you no longer have to worry about all the different colors that someone's wearing. So red looks almost black. And so that color information is gone because we're just into gray tones. So it's a little bit uh, easier in terms of what people are wearing because then it just becomes lighter gray tones or darker gray tones. So like reds, purples are all looking kind of on the, on the dark gray tone to the, towards the black uh, spectrum. And then you have the whites, like white, you know, grays, uh, yellows, neons, any kind of brighter things would be on that side. So the main thing when you're lighting for a, a black and white scene is that, uh, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, color temperature won't matter either because there's no color, right? So, uh, that's the thing. You won't be able to do these things like here where we're having a little bit of warmth added playing with daylight and tungsten lights. So you lose that. So now you have to really just play with like contrast. Um, and, and what it looks like. So, you know, you're welcome to, uh, you know, if you take a take an image, you can take this type of footage, uh, bring it into Resolve, and then you can make it black and white and, uh, and see what it would look like. But essentially, uh, you usually end up needing a bit more light in the separation and a little bit more in the key light. So it's, there's less worries in terms of the color uh, temperatures, but you definitely need to have a bit more uh, backlight and uh, key light to really make black and white work well. So yeah, really, really great question. Uh, perhaps we can look at that in a, in a future session as well, doing uh, lighting for black and white. So I would, I would be interested in doing that. So great, great idea, great question. And you can see this character is almost black and white too. So it kind of gives you an idea. You could use, I already added a bit more key light. So definitely needs a little bit more in, in that kind of scenario. Um, yeah, so that's great. Okay, well, that's pretty much uh, all our time for, uh, for today. So really, you know, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, once again, my name is Tom Sternad. I'm the lead digital artist of the Creator Space. I uh, want to thank all of our uh, uh, partners in this. So we have the Canada Council for the Arts and all our library partners. So we have the Blue Mountains Public Library, Collingwood Public Library, Rosario Beach Public Library. And uh, please definitely uh, check out the equipment and resources that are available. So members of the Blue Mountains Public Library, I'd like to remind everyone that you can get uh, access to the iMac computer station. So just go in and book and use them. Uh, it's all available. The digital arts equipment, including the Blackmagic Pocket 4K 
is available if you already have passed a proficiency test. If not, you can email uh, myself, tom at tbmcs.ca and I'll just put that up as well. You can email me and you can ask about getting a proficiency test uh, and how to, how to get through that. So I just put that up there. And uh, Wasaga Beach Public Library will be adding equipment there um, this month. So that will be available soon as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so thanks again, everyone. And uh, I hope you have a good uh, rest of the day. And I will see you guys soon.